from the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show, including Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Fill out a Sightlines report. Read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and so much more. Tonight's show is brought to you by Mighty Moose Beard Oil Company. It's 100% Canadian, 100% natural, taking care of beards around the world. Visit MightyMooseBeard.com. Don't forget to use promo code SOR2019 today. What's it like to be taken? Taken against your will by aliens? Trying to live a happy, normal life until this extraordinary experience happens. Well, this is why we're bringing in author Craig Jaycox tonight. His latest book, Aware of Their Presence, brings a first-hand account of what it's like to have these strange encounters with the unknown. His experiences are real. They began in his childhood, grew in intensity and frequency through his adult years, took a break. But guess what? They're back. Then in hour number three, I am going to bring you the SOR Newswire at the bottom part, brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. Mr. Craig Jaycox, it's been a few years since we've had you on this show, but I'm so glad that in your return that you have decided to choose Spaced Out Radio to relight and rekindle your stories of E.T. abduction. How are you doing, my friend? I'm fine, Dave. How are you? I am very good. Thank you very much. And it's been a few years since we were able to chat with you about this very important subject in regards to it. And we're going to get very deep into it throughout the show because there's so many different facets towards your case. But I want people to get to know you right off the bat. Were you always a believer in extraterrestrials? I was always open to it. Um, I, I never really had a problem with uh you know, these kinds of subjects, even as a kid. Uh, I, but, you know, to be honest with you, I think uh, even when I was a kid, I was watching In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy at the time and uh, other things that kind of had to do with, you know, other subjects that, you know, related to UFOs, whether it's UFOs or Bigfoot or I just, I just found those kinds of things fascinating, but I didn't think that it would actually be something that would be in my life. In your life, how? Because for a lot of people, it's easy to believe in this subject, Craig, but it's another to experience it altogether. Right. And that, that actually started actually as a kid um, with a sighting. And it's in the first chapter of my book. And um, basically, uh, you know, I mean, again, it's one of those things that kind of, you, you don't know what to do with it when it does happen. And I mentioned to you earlier that it's more like you go on instinct rather than on memory because there is nothing to relate it to. So um, basically it's like I did have a, a sighting when I was a kid with my family. Only one of the family members saw this, this craft, uh, but it was a nighttime sighting and it was very close. And uh, we, we both saw it and we, I didn't remember my sister actually seeing it also, but she brought it up a few months later and then we recalled it. And um, it was just like, wow, I can't believe even the direction that it flew over us. And this was a, a very big uh, spherical bright object. And it flew over us, dipped down, and it just disappeared like somebody turned off a light. And, I mean, again, it was an incredible thing, but I didn't realize that that was actually the start of many things later on. Interesting. Was there always a history in your family, outside of your immediate family, of ET contact or UFO sightings? That's actually a very interesting question because I don't bring it up that often, but um, there have been other family members who have seen um, crafts and UFOs. And it's interesting because uh, some of these things I didn't find out until like years later. And these are sometimes there were uncles that, you know, uncles and aunts and, and whatnot that uh, would very carefully and gingerly tell their story about something. So uh, I, I don't know, I, to be honest with you, as far as like, you know, how many, there have been quite a few that have had other, uh, you know, incidents or sightings. I think I'm the, either I'm the only one who's had the abduction experience or I'm the only one who's admitted it. 
See, that's weird for me, and probably for most people out there listening, Craig, because I don't ever recall growing up my dad or mom talking about UFOs or ETs or any right. other type of of species that is not from this planet. What was that like growing up in that atmosphere, where it was part of the conversation at times? Well, you know, it's it's just like with anybody else. I think basically it was there are some people that are open to it and some that are not. And that goes for family members also. Uh, there are family, family members that I do have that we still talk about it every now and then. And it's just kind of the basic uh, conversation. It's not a big deal. Whereas there are other uh, family members, both past and present, who would bring it up or would, would talk about it for a second and they didn't want anything to do with it. And uh, because, I mean, obviously there's a big stigma with the subject matter and people who have seen things or believe it, supposedly believe in these things. And it's just not easy to get into that subject all the time. It's a lot, it's a lot easier to me, but, you know, for some people it's, it's really not. And it's understandable. I mean, I don't push it with family members or anybody else who has had something happen. And if they don't want to talk about it, I'm, I'm always fine with that. Well, that's really cool that you are. Very cool that you are. Because on the flip side, I guess you understand all too well what it's like to be around people who don't believe. Correct. And that's not easy. Um, I, you know, it's funny because the uh, subject matter for the most part, when these incidents were happening, uh, I kind of got into the midst of it. You know, you get into the midst of a storm and believe it or not, it's kind of, uh, exciting in its weird way, in its own weird way. But I, I, as I've gotten older, I've gotten to the point where it's like, hey, I don't have to debate it. No, nobody's telling me that I have to. There's never been a rule saying that I have to debate and prove everything. Um, I feel like I'm telling the truth. I'm being honest. And I don't necessarily have to prove something to skeptics. Uh, skeptics always want to win. They always want to win the argument. They figure, figure they've got you know so much on their side. And if you don't have anything that you can actually show somebody, uh, for the most part, you know, I mean, it's, it's just your word. Then they feel like, you know, it's, it, they pretty much win the, the argument. But I've gotten to the point now where when I was younger, I felt like I wanted to win the argument. Now it's to the point where if there's a debate about it, um, I don't feel like I have to debate. I don't have to prove anything. I just know that within I'm telling the truth. When a lot of people will question you on this or be skeptical about what has happened, what are some of the criticisms and critiques you have taken about your story from first timers who have heard it? Well, again, you know, some some people. Yeah, I mean, I've done some public speaking in years past about it, and yes, um, obviously, you know, when when you do that, you pretty much have an audience of, of people who are either interested or just have their own experience, and they want to you know talk to somebody else or hear from somebody else who has. But overall, um, I'm sorry, your question was, again, it was basically how do you deal with... The critiques and criticisms that you have received about your story. Oh, okay. Uh, well, again, early on, it, it actually would get to me a bit, uh, because you take it pretty personally when the events themselves are so blunt and so obvious to you, and, you know, you can't really relate it to, uh, you know, everybody. Um, but you know, you try to seek somebody or seek people who actually will listen. And that's always a big test of it. You know, I was telling you earlier how it, it's kind of to the point where, um, the event is one thing, the second half is even worse, the scrutiny and, or at least trying to get somebody to understand. And I had to go through that for a while. I had to go through that fire for a while. Uh, but luckily I do have, you know, some friends and, and people who, I've made some friends actually within the UFO community, if you want to call it that. And they're still friends today because, you know, they understand that how hard this can be, or they've had their own thing happen or their own sighting. And they know how, how obvious it can, you know, it can be to try to explain it and just get shot down for it. Yeah. It's, it's kind of incredible how naive and, and, ununderstanding or misunderstanding people can be when you're sitting there telling them what is going on. I mean, many people, maybe even yourself, I know I have with my experiences, I've lost friends over it. I got family who doesn't yes. want to talk to me because I'm too too much of a weirdo over things like this. Right. 
Uh, and that's very true. Actually, you know, I was married at one time. I'm divorced now. Uh, I'm not saying that this, uh, this area, um, this subject was the reason why the divorce happened, but it certainly didn't help things. Um, it's, it's one of those cases where, you know, a lot of, uh, actually, if you look, do some research, a lot of people have gotten divorced, uh, not because directly of this subject, but it ends up being a factor, uh, in, in the relationship, especially when one person is, is experiencing and seeing something and the other person is not. And no matter how hard you try to press, uh, the subject and how honest you're, you're trying to be. Um, it doesn't get believed and it just looks more crazy. So it can cause a lot of problems. You can lose friendships. That's part of the cost of being involved in this in the first place. Craig Jaycox is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio, and we are talking about his own ET abduction experiences. Craig, with the people that you have surrounded yourself with, I mean, your family that you have now, is everybody very respectful and understanding of what you've gone through? Have they come to you with their own experiences? Some have. Uh, some have, you know, gone ahead and, and told me about things and we talk about things. Uh, others, for the most part, have been just respectful to me. And, you know, whether they really believe me or not, I'm not really sure all the time. But it's to the point where, you know, we do respect each other. They know that I've written a book. They know that I've, I've spoken about it. And, but, you know, again, the people who love you really love you no matter what. And I've got family and friends who really do. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. But I feel very sad for people who can't connect with other people or whose families pretty much, you know, will, will, you know, shoot down anything they have to say about this and don't, you know, aren't willing to listen. Right. So when they aren't listening, do you just move away? Just kind of say, whatever, you know, let's just keep the peace for the family's sake? Well, for the most part, right. I just don't approach, you know, the subject and just leave it alone. Uh, there are some family members that, that, you know, again, I just don't bring this up to. But, I mean, it's not the first, it's usually not the first thing in conversation anyway. Uh, you know, for instance, I would not go on a first date and start talking about, um, you know, UFOs and UFO sightings unless that person is somebody I met at a UFO convention or a new age convention or something. Uh, but, uh, but overall it's just something that, you know, it does not necessarily come up, but, um, overall, uh, I've been, like I said, I've been lucky, uh, but I have talked to many people over the years who have explained to me that it's been very hard for them to talk to others about it, and especially people in their family, uh, because you just automatically think that there's something mentally wrong. And I'm not saying that, <clears throat> There are, you know, some mental issues that do, you know, occur with this. There are some people who do have mental issues, and we should be showing compassion to them as opposed to uh, shooting them down and laughing. But, but when you've had some of the things that I've had happen and some, some very obvious things that some other people have had happen, I don't think those things can be just look, you know, just look away from them and not at least give them some kind of attention. All right. Well, let's start off. When did your first experience happen that you recall? Well, the the sighting I mentioned was actually very early. I was probably about, I don't know, um, somewhere between uh, maybe seven and eight years old or somewhere in there. But as far as the abduction experiences, uh, I actually, the first one was I lived out in Los Angeles for about seven years. And I remember it happening in the, you know, again, the 90s. Uh, actually, yeah, very maybe actually uh, it's somewhere in the early nineties and basically what it felt like and what it seemed like, again, you can't relate it to anything. I open my eyes. I can't move. I'm in bed. It's nighttime. And I feel this lift off from the bed, but I can't defend myself. I can't move. It feels like all your muscles are just not operating. And I could see things, tum- the, the room tumbling away from me and me going in the direction of what would be the window. But basically, uh, you know, I mean, I didn't see anything at the first time. I do remember when it ended, uh, it, I came back the same way I left. Basically, it just seemed like, you know, I, I had being pushed back by something, you know, and floating over the bed and then being gently put back on the bed. And when I woke, when I, I don't want to say woke up because it was, my eyes are wide open. I could see everything. But when I was able to move, I got up and um, I got sick. To my stomach. I tried to turn on the light. The light bulb blew out. 
uh, it was bizarre. I mean, it just it just got worse. <laughs> you know, the more seconds went by, it just went worse. But um, but after that, you know, it, it it started to happen in a little bit semi frequent kind of a way, where it would be the same scenario where you know I would wake up and I can't move, and you know a lot of people would think that's sleep paralysis, but the part that doesn't match with it is the the floating out part and seeing the ceiling, you getting closer to the ceiling, being able to move your eyes. And that's the only thing that you can move. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, it did get an intense, you know, as the years went on with that, but I, I don't want to say I got used to it, but it was more like I wasn't getting hurt. Nothing was being, you know, I, I physically, I never got hurt in it. And, um, I, it's not so much that I trusted whoever this was, but it got to the point where I almost got, you know, semi used to it, which makes how it old, sounds bizarre. To how say old were that, you at this point? I was probably in my, I was in my mid to uh, late twenties when that, when it, when it first started happening. When, I mean, and it's funny because again, you know, the first signing I had was as a kid, but the interesting thing about that is before the first abduction happened, I had memories of that first sighting. And I didn't know why I kept thinking about it. So it was almost like somebody was basically kind of turning a, a light back on, like, you know, to remember that because that was almost like a little bit of a buffer that that was the, the connection to this. And um, I remember that it was, it was bizarre that I thought about that. I kept thinking about that sighting over and over again. And I wrote that in the book that I kept saying, you know, before the first abduction, I kept having memories of the sighting and I just didn't know why. And then the, the abduction happened. And then I realized that might be the connection to it. The, the, why I will be remembering all of those, you know, be remembering that sighting over and over again. Hmm. Do you recall being an experiencer as a child? Not much. Um, not much. I, I don't remember that much as far as a child, but I did have one very bizarre incident that was very alive and in person. Um, I had an accident with my knee and you know, what I thought had happened was that I he was playing with, I was basically play, either playing with another kid and we were chasing each other and whatever like that. And I fell to my knee and I felt something very sharp hit me in the knee. And I thought, you know, initially that maybe there was something in the floor that I slammed my knee down on. But when I looked at my knee, it looked more like something was being pushed out. And I couldn't move my knee. It was, it was the worst pain at that point that I'd ever had. And what ended up happening was... Um, they, uh, my mom took me to the hospital. I got x-rayed and they said, you've got some kind of needle in your knee. And uh, I still couldn't move my knee. They had to basically strap it to the point where it's like, you know, I could, because if I bent it, it would have gotten a lot worse. So, um, but when I had the surgery to take it out and this was very traumatic, I mean, I was a little kid. I've never had surgery. I've never been really in the hospital for anything. Uh, but when they did the surgery, they removed this needle and then during the surgery, they found another small, sharp metallic object in the upper part of the knee that nobody Weird. knew anything about. So they took them both out and they showed them to me after the surgery. And they're like, well, here are the needles that were, or whatever that were in your knee. I'm like, I remember looking at my mom going, what's the S for? <laughs> what do they mean needles? I just remember the, like one sharp thing, but they, the, the other one was shorter and it almost looked like it was burned, like it was rusted, like it had been there for a long time or something but where it sat and they were two, they said, no, they were two separate uh, items in your knee, but nobody had any explanation as to what they were or why they were there. Do you think they were implants? I, at this point I do. Uh, I am because there's no, I don't have any recollection of uh, anything going into my knee or anybody doing any surgery on my knee to put something there. Um, so it's just very bizarre that these things would be there. And they actually said that the second object that they found during surgery looked like it was kind of wrapped very neatly in muscle tissue, like it was placed there. So, I mean, they didn't go any further than that. Uh, nobody really had an explanation as to what these two things were. And to this day, and by the way, <laughs> you know, for a while, my mom had those two objects in a photo album because it was so bizarre. And I remember looking for them and they were gone out of the photo album. Now, I don't know if she moved them or if they fell out or what, but 
uh, I don't know what happened to them. I don't have them. <laughs> so that's the end of that, that, that particular story. But as far as the, the objects in the first place, uh, nobody knows what they are. We have about two and a half minutes before we have to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Craig Jaycox is our guest tonight on the show talking about his ET experiences. What's your earliest recollection of full-on contact? Of, I'm sorry, of which kind of ET contact? Full, is that what you said? full, full on contact. Yes. Um, again, probably in the uh, in the '90s, early, very early '90s, um, and that was the first time that I realized, okay, something is happening here, and it's physical. Uh, now, I have to say, I did not see them at first. I didn't see right. them at first. It wasn't until a little later on that I kind of started to get some image of what they were. So yeah, I would say the early the early nineties is basically when I really started to get, you know, kind of the the feeling that this was something that's outside of me and that something is happening. Um, but uh it wasn't always bad and I will explain that a little bit later. Um, there were some times where it seemed to me like I was actually being helped, but it's still hard to explain as to why. Hmm. Do you ever sit back and wonder why you Oh, all the time. <laughs> well, I mean, not all the time. I don't let it preoccupy my mind, you know, all day and all night. But I have wondered why, and I've never really gotten an answer to that. Um, there's never really been an, a, a total explanation, although toward the end of the book, I do get a little bit of a message of something, but there's still a question mark to it. <laughs> so I don't want to give away everything and you know about that, but basically it's like um, there was a, a message that there's a reason to this, but there wasn't really any um, direct message as to why. Do you ever sit back, as we got about 45 seconds left, do you ever sit back and wonder about what the message is you're supposed to give the world about this contact? Well, yeah, I don't want to guess too much about it, but on the other hand, you know, I do wonder if it just has to do with, you know, knowing that they are here and that they want people to... I don't know, maybe relate the stories uh, to some degree. I don't know if there's, you know, some kind of, you know, reason for that or if there's a, a preparing us to know that there's, you know, something beyond us and they need a few people to, to do that. Or if there's some kind of scientific thing to it, I am really not sure, but I think we will find out. Well, we'll soon see. We're going to get deep into the book, aware of their presence. Okay. Craig is with us tonight, Craig Jaycox, the author of Aware of Their Presence, and we are going to get really, really deep. I want to hear these stories. He's got some incredible, incredible encounters that Craig is going to discuss with all of us tonight. We'll take your questions in hour two as well. More Spaced Out Radio, ET talk all night long. Let's do it. Stay tuned. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. 
Finish off your weekend and kick off your new week with me, Everett Themer, right here on Spaced Out Sundays. I'm going to bring you great guests, a little bit of snark, and plenty of information to think about. But don't worry, there's going to be plenty of woo as well. We are going to hit everything in the paranormal and supernatural, including the odd psychic Sundays. So tune us in on Sunday, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best five dollars a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencers Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Spaced Out Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Spaced Out Radio listeners today. Looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Hi there, this is Geraldina Roscoe from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. Looking for something new to push your limits? Look Beyond the Spectrum, a new docu-series featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and Bigfoot in the forest. Truth seekers like Steve Bassett, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Richard Dolan, as well as others all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page.
Welcome back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for joining us. want to remind all of you, if you miss portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, fill out a Sightlines report, read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Much more coming soon. I'm seeing and helping with the testing right now. I'm actually kind of excited about it, but I'll keep you guys guessing here in the next little bit. Craig Jaycox is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He is an ET experiencer and the author of the book, Aware of Their Presence, which can be found on Amazon. I highly suggest you pick up this book. I love what PBR said in the chat room. It's one of those fascinating, intense, easy reads that you never want to put the book down. So great review on that, PBR. Thank you so much. I'm sure Craig likes hearing that, too. Craig Jaycox, welcome back. Hi, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much, Dave. Not a problem. All right. We were kind of establishing in the first half hour about your experiences around you, your family, when they started happening to you. At what point did you feel that you needed to take these experiences that you had and start writing them down to build the book aware of their presence? Well, actually, uh, there was one incident where I pretty much felt like, okay, this was not my imagination. This is not uh, something I can just kind of push away. And that was the incident where I actually, um, I had an, a, another abduction incident when I was living in, in LA. And, but this time there was some evidence left afterwards. What ended up happening was uh, after, after the incident occurred, there were fingerprints on my bed sheet and they were not mine. And they were pretty obvious that it was something that had nothing to do with my hand because uh, relative to what I saw, this was a very, you know, large hand. And, uh, I did in, I, when I looked at it, I was in shock. Um, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, but this was actually that kind of turning point where I realized, okay, not only is this, you know, not a dream and not some kind of fantasy, not some kind of whatever, this was almost like somebody sending me a message saying, no, this is real. And it's actually that, that, that picture, there's a picture of it on the cover of my book, and inside the book, uh, there's a, a little bit of a better look at what the uh, prints look like. But when that happened, that was kind of like the turning point. That's when I knew I had to start writing about this. Uh, actually, my mom, I remember telling my, my mother, who you know knows about the subject and ha- has had her own sightings, uh, you know, back years ago, but they were you know something close up. She understands about this, and she was actually the one who encouraged me and said, you know what, you have to start writing this down. And that's basically what I did. That's where the book really started. When I told her about that incident with the fingerprints, that's when she told me, you have to start writing this down, too. Well, Craig, do me a favor. Tell us a story about the fingerprints. What happened there? Well, that was one of those incidents where, you know, I mean, again, it's, it was years ago. It was, again, in the 90s, but basically what ended up happening was it was the first time I remember being spoken to during the incident and um, or some kind of communication because all, all the other times it just seemed to me more like I was being kind of poked and prodded a bit about, you know, as far as almost like a physical kind of exam, and, but I never saw anything. This time I kind of saw a little bit. And when I was returned from it, it was almost as, as if I knew something different was going on. I, I didn't, it was hard to, you know, say exactly what, but when I was able to open my eyes, I turned on the light and it's kind of the light stayed on and I, I got up and I remember leaving and just washing my face or whatever like that, just to kind of clear my head and returning back to the bedroom. And I sat down, I decided, well, I'm going to leave the light on. And I, I mean, again, I was too old to be thinking that way, but I decided because I was just kind of shaken up that I'm going to leave the light on this time and I'll just sleep with the light on. And I leaned back, I turned over, I opened my eyes and I see this, like what looked like black streaks or smudges on the bed sheet. But when I got a closer look at it, I could see that it was actually kind of an out, well, it was basically what it looked like a hand. 
and what looks like a thumb. And then around the thumb, it looked like there was an outline of a claw. And I was like, okay, you know what? I pretty much jumped out of bed and stayed out of bed. <laughs> you know, I, I looked at it and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, I later on, I showed it to a couple of people. They really, they looked at it. They didn't have any comment to it. They didn't, you know, I, I did have a friend out there named um, Alfred and he took a look at it and he said, you know what? I, I did remember asking him because he took pictures and I said, could you take a picture of this? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead. You know, so he took pictures of it and I still thank him for that because I don't, I didn't have a camera and, um, he took pictures of it. And those are the pictures that are actually in the, uh, in the book of that print. Wow. It is absolutely incredible. If you want to take a look at it, just uh, Google aware of their presence and it's right on the front cover of the book. I mean, that is freaky. The, those pencil thin fingers. You know, my first alien abduction that I had, Craig, I was woken up on the table with the feeling of little childlike fingers going through my hair. Wow. And I got yeah. a lot of hair, man. And I got a lot of hair. <laughs> Well, again, it, it's again. You don't know how to react when it happens, and when it does, and you see something like that. And by the way, I have heard about people having what they call a benchmark incident, where they know at that point that that it's you know it's the real thing. For me, that was it. When when I saw those those fingerprints there, and looking at them, and not only that, but the reaction that I had to people when they looked at it and just didn't have anything to say, they couldn't explain it including people close to me. Uh, so uh, at that point, I knew, okay, you know what? This isn't in my imagination. This is totally real. And there's, you know, the weird thing is, the worst thing about it is, there's nothing I can do about it to or fro. You don't, you know, I mean, because you don't know whether it's a good or a bad thing. So it's, it's a very, it's disconcerting. But on the other hand, at least you have something to kind of back you up, even if it's only a little bit, that something happened to you. Mm -hmm. I can understand that, and I can appreciate that. With it, with those prints, how long were they actually there? Was it something where you just ruffled your sheets and they were gone? Because we always hear of some you know, people who have that type of contact, and the evidence just sticks around for a few days or a few hours. What was that like for you on this? It, 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 they, I, you know, obviously, you know, I took the sheet off and just uh, put it somewhere, but they gradually started to fade. And, you know, it just, it, just like anything, I mean, basically, it's like, you know, it, it seemed to me, um, when I had the pictures taken of them, that was probably about a day or so after the incident. But as, you know, time went on or whatever like that, they gradually began to fade. And then you could basically not see it anymore. I mean, I knew where it was, but it just faded away. And, um, I did want to get it tested or something, but again, how do you approach anybody with that kind of, you know, I mean, can, you know, it's not like you can go to the police and say, you know, can you test this and dust this and see what this is and try to explain to them what you think it is. Um, so it's, it was a very, that's the whole balancing act with the entire, you know, abduction or UFO uh, area is trying to get, you know, profess the reality to it to others or to get something tested and, you know, basically be either debunked or, uh, you know, be told that you're just crazy or whatever. This is why a lot of people just can't step forward and just be honest about it. It's hard for people though, because when you go through an experience like this, I mean, you question your own reality. Exactly. Exactly. Again, you're going on instinct and not on memory because there's nothing to connect it to. And we're not at a point where, you know, uh, you get raised to think, oh, you know, yes, there are things outside of us and, and whatever. I mean, that's not the normal uh, way of going about things. So um, I have to be honest. I mean, for a long time, even after that incident happened, uh, I kind of went, well, wait, you know, you start wavering again. You start thinking, well, okay, maybe I do have some kind of mental issue or maybe there's some kind of sickness that I don't know about and this is causing this. Um, but there's always something that kind of takes you out of the category of, 
epilepsy or schizophrenia or, you know, any other kind of something where it's, you know, you, there's a hallucinatory uh, component to it. And um, for me, I mean, I just, um, again, when it got physical, that's when I started thinking, okay, no, this is something else. Hmm. Something beyond a mental illness or be beyond any kind of mental um, ailment. Were they always physical with you? Well, but again, not well, yes, to some degree, but never to the point where I was hurt. And I, you know, never, I, again, it felt more like examinations. Uh, but there have been times, again, where they've shown up where I've gotten help. And I don't want to necessarily congratulate them uh, because I still don't know, even at this point, uh, what they are and what they really represent. But there have been times where I've gotten sick and they've shown up and and done something where I'm feeling better all of a sudden. And I have no idea what that is. I don't know what, you know, obviously I'm not a scientist um, and I would not be able to explain it, but let's just say, for instance, um, I've had some issues. I've had pneumonia before, you know, when I was younger. And then I've had some issues with my lungs because of, you know, once you have pneumonia, you're kind of open to other lung things, you know, pneumonia and other ailments of the lungs or whatnot. I do remember having, you know, things sometimes happen like that where something comes up where my lungs are starting to get affected. And suddenly the next night some, something happens where I get either abducted or there's some kind of experience. And then the next morning I'm fine. And it doesn't make any sense because I'm thinking I have to go to the hospital. You know, be, before when I'm sick, I'm thinking I have to go to the hospital. And then all of a sudden something happens where, you know, they show up in some kind of odd way. And the next morning, I'm fine. It doesn't make any sense. So I don't know if, it, if they're protecting me, and if they are, I don't know why. Craig Jankox is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. His ET objection is what we are talking about, but his book, Aware of Their Presence, you can find it on Amazon. When you started realizing that these experiences were real, they were happening to you, you were having this kind of contact, how long did it take for you or how many experiences did you have that were very vivid that you finally said to yourself, this is truly what's happening to me and I cannot stop it? Well, actually, when I moved from California and moved back to the Midwest, and then I realized that the, when the incidents started happening again, even after I moved, uh, that's when I kind of went, all right, you know, I am being, it feels like I'm being followed and I don't want to say the word tagged, but that's kind of what you feel like. You feel like basically it's one of those cases where no matter where you go, um, they're, they're kind of around you. And again, the reasons as to why they're around you, I have no idea, but I've been in different states where I've had different incidents. Uh, one of the uh, uh, chapters in the book is during my honeymoon when I, I was married. I'm, I'm not no longer married, but um, we went to Arizona, to Sedona, Arizona, which a lot of people know is a very kind of new age and mystical place. And it's a beautiful place. But uh, we had an incident there, me and my ex-wife, and there was no explaining why we would you know, see a UFO outside of our room at night. And, you know, a very, very obvious one, you know, saucer shaped, gold, bright, hovering outside of our room. And we're out on the patio looking at it. And I'm, t I'm telling her, I don't know what this is. I haven't seen anything like this. Have you? And she didn't say a word at first. She just stared. Um, that was a Thursday night. And uh, we went to sleep. Friday went by fine. But Saturday morning, there were a bunch of helicopters flying over our room and going toward where we saw the craft. And we kind of looked at each other and said, you know what, let's just go for the day. We didn't see anything goodbye. And we left that. <laughs> we left the room. I so again, yeah, you know, I, I had no idea what was going on with that. I didn't want to stay, stick around for the helicopters. There were about six or seven of them that flew over our room and went right to the direction of where we saw this thing. Um, and I've got nothing against the military or the government or anything that's looking into this because it, it, I have nothing to do with them. Um, you know, I, I don't have any uh, plus or minus about them as far as the subject goes. But when we saw that, we were like, okay, you know what, enough. Let's just go ahead and 
enjoy our day in Sedona and we'll come back later. But interestingly enough, and I wrote this in the book, when we got back, we were told that we have to move from the room by management. So we had to move from the room and go to another room. Why? And actually, yeah, I have no idea, but I, I mean, I have a feeling about it. Uh, I don't necessarily want to speculate too much, but I get the funny feeling that um, somebody was, when we went out that day, you know, after saying, okay, we have nothing to do with this. Let's just go ahead and go get breakfast and just spend the day out. I don't know. Somebody may have approached the management and just said, look, somebody has to look into this room and whoever's in it has to leave for now. But we got moved to a different room and uh, it was never really explained to us why. Uh, I actually know it was explained to us why they told us that uh, we overbooked and uh, we, we thought that, you know, this room was going to be open for a while, but apparently somebody else scheduled, was scheduled to be in this room and we had to move. But we had actually booked that room months in advance. So it didn't make any sense to us. I can totally see that. I can totally see where yeah. that would that would come into play. We've got about five minutes left before we need to take a break at the top of the hour. Craig Jaycox is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Craig, when you started getting these experiences more frequently and they started happening and you're starting to realize that this is all too real, this is now part of your life, how often were these experiences happening? Well, when they first started happening, actually, when I lived out in Los Angeles for a little while, uh, it seemed to me like I was marking the calendar and it seemed like it was maybe <laughs> sometimes once or twice a month. And then it slowed down. Uh, but th there was no way to really predict it. I, w I guess I was trying to figure out if there was a way to time it, but there really wasn't. Um, there, you know, but it was mostly frequent, most frequent when I lived out in Los Angeles. And then when I moved back to the Midwest, uh, it was still fairly frequent, but it wasn't nearly as frequent as it was when I lived out in Los Angeles. Um, but um, since then, though, honestly, I'm going to say from the, let me be the early 2000s, it really slowed down a lot. I mean, I, I, did, I, I don't, didn't really recall much. It was more like I would get that help, quote, help, unquote, that every now and then something would happen and, you know, they would show up somehow. But it wasn't so much the abductions or anything like that. It was more like an appearance, <laughs> more like a cameo, if you want to call it mm -hmm. that. But um, it wasn't, a, it, it seemed to me like it was mostly when I was in my 20s when I had the most intense uh, times and early thirties, maybe. Were they happening just at night? Was it happening during the daytime, morning, all hours of the day? Uh, most of the time it was at night. Uh, I don't really have a lot of recollections of, you know, the daytime type things, but I wasn't immune from that either. You know, I mean, basically it, it seems to me, I, I, I can't really recall totally as far as like, you know, too many daytime uh, issues. But I can't say there were none. Uh, there were, all, you know, other incidents that, again, included sightings and, and whatnot. And sometimes during just taking a nap. It, now, see, this is where the argument comes in about sleep paralysis and, and whatnot. But, again, for me, it was always uh, before, you know, something was kind of already going on, whether it be some kind of illness or some kind of, you know, just not feeling well or whatever. And some something would show up, and something would happen, and then I was fine. So that's why, in a way, you know, uh, there's a lot more to that actually, because something else was found in my body later on. And I know we only have a few minutes, so I'll get into that a little bit later. But something else was found in my body, else similar to the things that were found in my knee as a child. Mm. So who's taking you? Well. For the most part, I would say that it has to do with the, the grades that people talk about. Um, I don't really have, a, I've never really classified them, but as far as looks wise, uh, that's what I've seen when I have seen them. And it's always been very brief. There's never really been, you know, a, um, a long, you know, grand encounter with them to talk with them and whatever like that. And if, if anything, they're very blunt and direct. Um, and I don't really get a lot out of them, but when I do get something out of them, I'm like, oh, okay, finally, somebody decided to talk <laughs> or somebody decided to say something or whatever. Um, but 
right now at this point in my life, uh, I haven't had much of anything happen. And some people say that after about 40, it seems to slow down a lot to the point where it's almost like non-existent, but uh, they seem to always kind of be around. What species of grain? Like, are we talking the the three to four footers, the five to six footers, the seven to eight footers? What are you dealing with? I, uh, the, the, I'm going to say, well, look, I'm actually about uh, somewhere between five, six and five, seven last I saw. Uh, but basically, I'm talking about uh, beans that are shorter than me, uh, probably in the, you know, four foot, five foot, maybe range that I've seen. Again, oh, wow. you know, I, 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 I wish I could actually, you know, uh, again, say more about seeing them, but it's really more of that had sighting and abduction experiences as opposed to seeing them and interacting with them much. Uh, but like I said, when they have interacted, it's been very short, very blunt, uh, not necessarily mean, uh, but just to the point where, you know, well, that's it, that's it to the point. Uh, they don't really have, uh, it's not like, hey, how you doing? What's been going on lately? Whatever. Um, it's more like you have this, we're going to take this, we're going to do this, blah, blah, blah. And it's more of a commanding type thing as opposed to a, you know, conversation. Do you feel bullied? No, no, not, not really. Um, but I, I just feel more like I want a reason why, and I'm not getting it totally. Um, you know, or I hadn't gotten it in those years. And again, there's still maybe some kind of explanation for it. Again, there may be, um, you know, I have not necessarily ruled out a mental uh, issue or some PTSD issue or, or whatever. Uh, and I don't say that lightly, but uh, for the most part, you know, from what I've gotten, um, I don't feel bullied, but I just don't feel like I'm getting the whole story. And that's always bothersome, which is why I don't promote them as good or bad. Uh, Because I just don't know what they're doing and why they're doing it. Craig, as we go to break here in just a moment, I want to just kind of get into in the next hour, along with some audience questions, because I know they're going to start building up, about how you felt, what they did to you. Do you feel violated? Do you feel like you are, you know, almost like a science experiment for them? Because I think that's very important. A lot of people tend to believe that when it comes to ET abduction, it's all about the bad and the ugly. But was there any good? We'll find out from you in hour number two. Craig Jaycox is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. His book, Aware of Their Presence, can be found on Amazon. What a great story tonight. We'll have more right after this on Spaced Out Radio. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiemann. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. 
SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. We are getting ready to relaunch the SOR Space Travelers Club at SpacedOutRadio.com. For $5 a month, you can join us for a plethora of features found nowhere else. Hang out in a private chat room during the show and after party. You can check out some exclusive content and a store specifically for you, as well as a private listener forum where you can post your thoughts, stories, and pictures. The SOR Space Travelers Club, coming soon to spacedoutradio.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. We're bringing you something new to the documentary world. Beyond the Spectrum will take you on an historic tour of topics like no other. Sasquatch, UFOs, government secrecy, and more. Keeping you on the edge of your seats through the eyes of legendary truth seekers like Steve Bassett, Richard Dolan, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, and Jack Kasher. Head on over to Amazon Prime or Tubi TV and check us out. Please leave a comment for the filmmakers on their film's Amazon page. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hang out with Spaced Out Radio, where we own the night. This is Carl. You can follow Dave on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and during the show, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to chat with us live. On Instagram, at Dave Scott SOR. On Facebook, give our page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. SOR archives are free on YouTube, at Spaced Out Radio. Come join us, or I will come join you. See you at your window. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? 
Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencer Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Space Star Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Space Star Radio listeners today. This is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for being with us. We want to say hello to everyone listening in on WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia. UPRN 107.7 FM in Reedsport, or make that New Orleans. Down in Reedsport, Oregon, KDUN AM 1030. Down in Ridgecrest, California, KZFX 93.7 FM and KDNF AM 1560 in Dangerfield, Texas. On the digital side, hi to everyone listening in on Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. Great to have you with us. Don't forget, you can check out all of our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davy the favor. Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Schmegagy. Schmegagy is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bubblefoot. Fill out a sightlines report if you've had something strange or weird happen to you that you want investigated. We'll get right to that. And, of course, read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, which is updated daily by Captain Shirk. Tonight, we are talking with author Craig Jacobs. He is an ET experiencer. He has a book out called Aware of Their Presence. You can find it on Amazon. It's a great read. Highly suggest you grab it, and you will not be disappointed. This is a firsthand account of his own experiences over the years. Craig, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Dave. When you were taken up on craft or wherever you were taken, how are you treated? Um, well, you know, some people talk about it being like, you know, basically being treated like a lab rat. Um, and I, I'm not going to necessarily say it was that bad, but I'm certainly not going to say that it was fun. Um, it wasn't, um, it was more of a, um, it did seem very clinical and it seems just very, again, um, not getting the answers that you want. And, you know, I mean, being, not being able to move is one thing but also really not being able to really say anything because I, I do remember trying to say something to, with my mouth early on with these incidents and you can't say anything. Uh, you can think it, but you can't say it. And um, that was always very frustrating, but it seemed to me like it got a little bit better as time went on because for whatever reason, it just seemed, I guess maybe either I got calmer about it or I kind of got used to it. And the more I got used to it, the less it seemed to be a restraint to deal with. Um, so um, it's, it, again, it's hard to explain to people who have never gone through this. Uh, people who have gone through it, they, they kind of get it. They understand where I'm coming from. And again, people who are open-minded about it, they, they tend to understand it. But to anybody else, this is just crazy talk. And, um, you know, I, again, I've, I've gone through a lot, actually. This has been through my childhood. I'm now 53 years old and I've mellowed as far as like trying to find out what it really is all about and trying to explain it and trying to prove it. Now I'm more to the point where it's more like, okay, yes, it happened. I don't have to debate about it as I mentioned in the first hour, but uh, I, as far as the way they treated me overall, like I said, very clinical and just very blunt, um, not really a lot of talk. But again, there have been times where I've gotten some unusual help, and it seems like it came from them. What kind of experiments did they do on you? Do you recall? 
a well to a degree I do. Um, I do remember, um, again, a lot of times it was being poked and prodded, and it did seem to me a few times it seemed like I got x-rayed somehow uh, where they basically told me, keep my eyes closed, and I could see, even with my eyes closed, a very bright light going over my body a couple of times. Um, but um, outside of that, there was, and I don't mean to get too blunt here, but um, I do remember uh, sperm being taken, and it wasn't the tra- traditional way, but it was, um, you know, just very, again, very clinical. And, uh, again, not in pain, not in any real awful discomfort, but to the point where the shock of seeing that happen or seeing any of these things happen, uh, obviously very disconcerting and hard to explain to others. So, you know, again, I've got some friends who I can talk to and some family members who understand, who have studied, you know, other stories about this, who understand it. But overall, to the general public, uh, this is not something that you can just say this happened to me and expect people to understand it. No, I, I fully understand with, with what you're going to. You mentioned that you had sperm taken. Now, obviously, there's ways that we have heard that that happens with a lot of extraterrestrial contactees and abductees. Do you believe, then, that you have some sort of hybrid children out there? I have no idea. Uh, I have not really been told that or uh, necessarily shown that. Um, I, I've heard that, that. I've read about those kinds of stories. And I've heard that that was, you know, one of the um, uh, ideas that has, you know, kind of occurred with this, that the, both men and women have had, like, you know, they've seen this happen to them as far as, like, uh, being in this experience and having either ova or sperm taken. Uh, but not everybody has seen the result of that. Or if there was a result of it, uh, they've not been shown. Uh, I can't say for sure that uh, I don't want to speculate on that, but... I cannot say for sure that I've been shown that uh, the result of, you know, what was taken from me produced anything. Uh, I, now, I will say this. I don't have any actual children. Uh, when, I, uh, when I was married, my uh, ex-wife and I, we didn't have kids. So uh, I don't really have any children. So uh, I don't know if there's anything, anything else going on beyond this. But I have never had any, um, any evidence that anything like that was uh, produced. How do you think you would feel in knowing that the sperm that was taken from you ended up creating some sort of hybrid children that you haven't even met yet? Well, I probably would be at the same place that I was um, when it, when the abductions first started. Again, it would just have to be something that I would have to flow with and go with on instinct. And it would even be more so this time because, again, I don't have any actual kids. So if something actually, you know, occurred where, you know, this was presented, I probably wouldn't know how to react outside of just being my usual nice and friendly self and, you know, again, just approaching very, you know, gingerly about it. And, um, but I wouldn't have any record. I don't have any memory of being a father uh, on this plane or any other plane. So if there was something else going on uh, on another plane, I wouldn't really know how to approach it. But you again, I would not be. Well, that's probably been, uh, when it comes to this experience, that's probably been the furthest thing from my mind because, right. again, I haven't really experienced anything directly. So, uh, but I, you know, I, I, just as a human being, uh, I would, I would deal with it. I would, I, I would deal with it. But again, it's not something that has been presented. So I don't really have anything to, um, you know, to really file it to, to say on that. Right. Let's get to Jade's question here. Jade is asking, did you ever assert your human right not to be abducted? Uh, to a degree, yes. And it's a good question. Um, I did uh, mainly me asking, what are you doing and why? Uh, as opposed to, you know, getting very angry. But um, I, I remember, and this is and not a direct, you know, quote, but I do remember one of the saying that, you know, they screamed out in their mind, you have no right to do this. You have no right to do this. And the answer that they got was, we have the right. 
So it's almost as if, like there's some kind of ownership almost. And uh, that part I really do have a problem with because, again, even to that person, whoever that was, nothing was really explained to them except a command, more like we can do this and you really don't have a say in it. Uh, so as a human being, yes, I do get upset because I don't, knowing that you're not getting any answers there and knowing that you're not going to get any answers from anybody here is extremely frustrating. Um, so yes, the anger does come out to a degree, but I've never really, but see, the problem is, I don't want to say the problem, but again, I've never really been hurt. I've really just been more curious. I guess back then I was really more curious about if this happens again, I'll learn more. But that's kind of the carrot on the stick thing. You know what I mean? You're kind of chasing all the time and you're not really getting it. You're just kind of, you know, always chasing. So in a way, I feel like I've kind of been fooled in that sense. Um, but I I understand where, uh, I'm sorry, what was the person's name again? That Jade. Asked, what was it? Jade. Okay. I understand where Jade's coming from. And um, I, but I've never, as far as my experiences, I don't really remember getting so angry to the point. Although, yes, there was one point where I got angry where another family member seemed to be involved. And that's toward the end of the book. I, I, it's, unfortunately, I can't get that far into that because that person is a member of my family and I don't know if they would really want me talking about it. But I did get angry and it's, but it's more written in the book than, um, yeah, talking about it now almost gets me frustrated too. But, so that was the first time I actually really got angry with them and told them not to include this person. If you want to deal with it, deal with me, but don't do this to this person. And uh, right. that's, again, it, it would take long. It, I guess it would take too long to actually explain it here, but uh, that was the time where I actually did get angry. Mm-hmm. They often, they being the grays that you were dealing with, and we've heard this before from other people, seem very emotionless to everything. When you were getting angry with them, did they notice? Did they take note? Did they seem to be compliant with what you were asking? Uh, actually, one did. There was one that, and again, this was the, the longest communication I had with them. And uh, when this incident happened, and again, it's easier to explain once you see the book, but uh, when this incident happened, I saw somebody in my family uh, look like they were unconscious, and I could very clearly see these beings now in this incident. And I remember looking at this family member and going, no, you cannot do this to, I'm just going to say her. And, you know, this is, this is about me. I don't care if you want to do something with me, deal with me, but not with her. And one of these beings, and apparently it was female because I heard a female's voice, looked at me and said, have we ever hurt you? Have we ever done anything to hurt you physically? And I thought about it. And all these years that I remember, honestly, I said, no, I said, you know what? Actually, no, you've never hurt me. And the response that I got from there was, then why would we ever hurt her? Don't worry. She's fine. And it was, it was a nice voice. It was one of the, that was the only time where I kind of felt like there's some compassion. Somebody's actually listening to me and they're caring about, they're caring about what I have to say. But that was the only time I really got that long of a, you know, conversation, I guess. But again, it was still kind of blunt. It was really more like, we're going to reflect this back on you. Have we ever hurt you? And the truth was, no, I have not been hurt. So no, we, we're not going to hurt her either. She's fine. You're going to be fine too. So mm. that was probably the longest communication I had gotten. And then I got another communication after that, during that incident, where a male told me, look, we understand that you don't know what's going on with you right now with all this, but soon you'll know why. And now that was years ago. I still don't know why. So soon to them may be many years for us. I have no idea. Hmm. So when you are hearing them, what do they sound like? Because obviously they're talking to you telepathically, but did you hear any right. of their voices, any of their sounds? Uh, n nothing that was unusual. Uh, I think basically it's more like, um, you know, I remember watching the Tom Cruise version of The Mummy. And at one point, this one scientist wanted to talk to The Mummy and said something in the old language. And I guess that the mummy looked back and said, the old gods, your language, it's very simple. You know, it kind of surprised her that, that, you know, this mummy barely could speak the language. So 
so I almost feel like it's something like that in the sense that they just kind of pick up from where you are. I mean, people who are Hispanic uh, have said that basically they've talked in their language. And people of other, you know, uh, dialects, they've talked in those languages to them, to whoever the FFB is. So I kind of feel like they just kind of communicate with you the way that you know communication is. And so when you hear them, it sounds like your language and a human voice. But I don't know what they themselves would sound like if they, you know, have any kind of other kind of communication. I wouldn't know. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can I can see that and understand that. Uh, PBR wants to know, what did it look like on the ship? Um, I, you know, actually, when uh, the, the clearest sight that I got, again, goes back to that incident where somebody else, and, you know, that I know my family was involved, um, it was very clean, but it also was very clinical. It, it, it really it looked and sounded like a lab and um, it just was and very smooth. Uh, basically the top of what I, I remember looking up and seeing what looked like kind of like the inside of a dome and it was very smooth. Uh, I don't remember seeing a lot of creases anywhere or um, whatnot, but uh, it was just very kind of glowing and white, but I could see these beings clearly during this incident. And um, that was the first time I really saw them very clearly one of them actually stood out a lot more because he, and I will say he, seemed to have like very pronounced cheekbones and almost like a nose where the rest of these beings did not have that. It was just basically the eyes, the very, you know, narrow looking mouth or, or nose or whatever. Um, maybe not, maybe not even that, maybe just the eyes, but there was one that just looked a little bit more defined in his features, I guess. And uh, that one, yeah, that one didn't talk. <laughs> that one didn't have anything to say. But that's what I recall from that. That was many years ago. Um, and again, I have no idea if there's always a part of you that goes, okay, how real is this? But, you know, as, t- as time moves on and nothing happens. But for the most part, I just get the feeling, yes, there's something going on. Uh, somebody would ask me yes or no, I'm going to say yes. Do you recall lights on the ship? Any buttons? Any other people? Uh, uh, outside of that one incident, I don't recall any other people. Um, I, for the most part, it seemed like it was pretty much, um, whether they had other people or not, I'm not really sure. It wasn't like the, uh, well, well, the Travis Walton experience where they kind of did the movie and you saw these different pods and whatnot or something like that. I didn't see anything like that. Uh, it's always been very clean and clinical. But um, right. I never saw any other people. Right. couple questions coming from Eric or Eric's beard. We never know which one it is. He's asking, mm-hmm. do you know what type of gray race you were dealing with? And how many times do you recall being taken? Oh, I've lost count of. And there are also some incidents that don't have anything to do with me being in bed and being abducted. So it's hard to say uh, how many times this actually happened. As far as what kind of grays uh, they were, I see again, there's a part of me, and and, and no offense to um, the questioner, but there's a part of me that keeps a little bit of distance on on this. There's, I don't want to get so involved that it starts to envelop me a little bit too much. So I don't know the different types of species and and, and whatever, because I've seen the different types of um, things that people have either drawn or have come up with as far as like what types they are. But I can pretty much only go by personality and personality wise, uh, they don't seem to be that much different from what other people have talked about. You know, again, very blunt, kind of commanding, not wasting any words. Uh, for the most part, that's what I've gotten. So I'm not really sure what, you know, as far as like breeds and types, I'm not really sure. And I don't mean to disappoint anybody. It's just that I haven't gone into that part of this uh, subject matter much. That's actually quite interesting, though, Craig. Like, for a lot of people, myself included, when I started having my own experiences, I was really, really in need 
of researching, finding out absolutely everything that I could. Why did you decide to go in a different direction? Well, I think it's not so much a different direction. I, I think it's more like my focus was more on others who have had this experience and what they experienced and if what they were going through was what, what I was going through. Um, and I think I focused more on that part of it, the, the human to, you know, um, uh, whatever the alien, uh, interaction as opposed to, you know, where they're, where they may be from and, um, what their exact motives are and whatever. I think basically my step one was to see other people and to find out, you know, to, to kind of understand that the experience as to why it's happening and what they felt and if, what I felt was the same thing. So that's kind of the direction I first went. Um, you know, I do recall looking into the grades a little bit, but there was, I have to be honest with you, Dave, there was one time I remember in California, I remember looking at a picture of a gray and it kind of got me to the point where I almost had a panic attack. I just, it, maybe it was just too defined of a picture, but um, right. you know, I, I mean, I, I can look at the image now and I'm fine, but I think then it was to the point where I couldn't look at it and I had problems with it. Um, and uh, I remember hearing about uh, somebody looking at when Whitley Streeter's uh, communion first came out in the eighties, a woman walking by a bookstore, well, it used to be bookstores in malls, but you know, she walked by a bookstore and there was this thing on the cover and she had had these experiences and she basically fainted um, because of that image. So, I get it. I, I think that's kind of where where I kind of was too. I mean, I kind of didn't want to get too close because I would look at it and it just did not elicit the right feelings within myself. So I um, maybe that's one of the reasons why I didn't study them that much. Right. All right. Let's move on to another question from our audience here. As we got about uh, oh about a minute here, if we got to carry over the answer, we can do that too. And this one comes from Jade again, who is asking, did the extraterrestrials ever tell you where they were from? No, but there was one indication that they, um, there was one constellation that I remember seeing during one incident. It was very clear. And I found out that was the constellation of Taurus. Now, the interesting thing is the constellation of, of Taurus does not necessarily come up a lot big in the whole UFO, uh, you know, conversation. But I think the Taurus uh, constellation is somewhere, uh, like the Pleiades is also nearby or something. It's one of the other constellations. When you look at a constellation map, it's not that far off from it. So I don't know if that's where they're from or if that's what they have right. to do with. But it's right. just funny that that's like a guidepost. Sure enough. Craig Jaycox is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. More about his book, Aware of Their Presence, which can be found on Amazon. Make sure you check it on out. We're talking ET abduction all night long here. We'll be back. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there. This is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. 
we're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! Looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best $5 a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Finish off your weekend and kick off your new week with me, Everett Themer, right here on Spaced Out Sundays. I'm going to bring you great guests, a little bit of snark, and plenty of information to think about. But don't worry, there's going to be plenty of woo as well. We are going to hit everything in the paranormal and supernatural, including the odd psychic Sundays. So tune us in on Sunday, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. We're bringing you something new to the documentary world. Beyond the Spectrum will take you on an historic tour of topics like no other. Sasquatch, UFOs, government secrecy, and more. Keeping you on the edge of your seats through the eyes of legendary truth seekers like Steve Bassett, Richard Dolan, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, and Jack Kasher. Head on over to Amazon Prime or Tubi TV and check us out. Please leave a comment for the filmmakers on their film's Amazon page. Hey, 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 hey. 
We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Great to have you along with us. Thank you so much. Reminder to all of you that if you have missed portions of this show or others, you can always check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. You can fill out a sightlines report. Also, don't forget, read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and much more. Tonight we are talking with author Craig Jacox. He's got a book on Amazon called Aware of Their Presence. We're talking about his ET contact and experiences. Craig, welcome back. Thank you, Dave. Now, you have been implanted before. You have been Correct. able to have pieces come out of your body. Do you have implants still in you? Uh, I do. Uh, I have um, the, the objects that were found in my knee were taken out, but I have I found out on actually April 7th, 2005. I remember writing this down, and this was after the book was written. Um, actually, I've got two other items that are in my back, and they're at toward the end of my spine. And uh, they showed up on an x-ray, and I was told by some of the finest doctors that we actually have here in the United States, uh, we're not going to take these out. We're not going to try to get those. And when I asked why, they said, well, because you're risking paralysis if we did. And so it's almost as if somebody put them in there uh, knowing, hey, maybe he will find out or maybe they will be seen. They just don't want them taken out. And now I'm going to be basically stuck with these. Whatever they are, whoever put them in, um, they put them in a place where they cannot be taken out. Hmm. That's kind of uncomfortable that they would risk going in near your spine. Well, obviously, you know, outside of my brain, um, those are places that people obviously would not want to be digging into and, and taking a risk at. So I think it was very purpose. Uh, again, I'm not really sure who did this, but you know, I mean, at first I even uh, went to the um, went to the extent of thinking that could this possibly be something ritualistic that I totally missed out on that that you know I was knocked out or something. But there would have been some kind of residual pain, obviously. So whoever did this knew what they were doing and did it very uh, in a much very high tech way whether it's something earthly or beyond that, I'm not sure. But again, I'm not hurting. I'm not saying I'm thrilled about having those objects in me, but um, that they haven't caused me any problems, but I just don't know what they're doing there. And um, I, I on one, the last time I went on a vacation where I had to fly, I actually got detained by security because I kept putting the, I kept, you know, walking through and the metal detectors kept going off. And finally, they had to do the wand. And when they did the wand and they got toward the lower part of my back, they're like, okay, it's something with your torso, um, your back torso. But, um, you know, we're not going to go any further than that or anything like that. You can go, but you've got something in your body. And when I got the x-rays after that, that's when they showed up. They were very clear. Uh, so I'm not really sure what they're doing there or what, what the reason is. Just like with a lot of things with this experience. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. When you find these, how many are in your body right now? Uh, again, just as far as I know, only those two. Uh, and now the interesting thing is, by the way, the, the way that they were originally found was because I was working retail at the time, and I walked by, when I leaned back on one of the, um, you know, uh, oh, geez, I'm forgetting the, the name of it, <laughs> the, the part that the scanner, I'm sorry, you know, you basically it's yes. like, you know, they park it next to the register and it's pointing down. And again, I'm about five, six or so, somewhere between five, six and five, seven. And the thing was pointing right toward my waist and it rang me up. Basically, I don't mean to be funny, but basically what happened was it made a noise. It wasn't the usual noise that we hear, almost sounded more like a buzzer. And me and a coworker looked at the screen and it said something like, Signal cannot be recognized by uh, whatever system. So obviously it's some kind of signal of some type. And um, I 
sat down because my legs were starting to get weak. And my coworker at the time, he's passed away, unfortunately, but he kind of, you know, patted me on the back and kind of said, hey, you know, why don't you just relax for a while? Uh, because he knew that I had written a book and they knew that I talked about these things. But that kind of threw me, you know, quite a bit off. That's when the, these other things started happening, the airport and the x-ray was after that. And uh, that's when we found out that we had these, that I had these two uh, pieces, metal pieces in my back. Hmm. Do you believe they are some sort of transistor or GPS marker for you? Um, it could be, I don't know. Again, it's like, you know, I would, I'd rather not speculate too much on it, but I did remember calling the company that made the scanner and they said, I said, is there a way that you can find out where that came from? I can tell you the time and the date and everything like that. And they, they said yes. And they said, you know, they get back to me, but then they didn't get back to me for a while. So I had to call them back and say, okay, I called, you know, my name is, you know, Craig Jacox. I called about the signal and whatever on this record. And, and they basically said, oh, they said they couldn't find it. And they basically hung up the phone. So I don't know if they actually found something, didn't want to talk about it, or if they just thought this sounds too crazy, you know, we're not going to deal with this. But they uh, they seemed very cooperative at first. And then, you know, I called them, when I called them up to find out about it, they basically just coldly told me, no, we can't, they said they couldn't find it, goodbye. <laughs> Why do you think they're shying away from from what is in your body right now? They being the doctors. Uh, well, yeah, the doctors, honestly, I was more frustrated with them than I was with the, the alien beings or whatever, whoever they are, um, because I've told them, look, there's no way I could have put these in my body. This is the second time I've found metal. I've had metal found in my body, and I don't know what this is. There's no surgical scar or there might be like this little line on my, on my back, but it's so faint that there's no way of saying that it was a surgical scar. And they just don't seem like they want to have anything to do with it. They, you know, most of the doctors that I've gone to and talked to, they acknowledge that yes, you have these metal pieces in your back, but nobody wants to talk about how or why nobody speculates. I'm the one speculating and they're the doctors and they're not speculating. So, uh, either they're not, they don't have a guess but they pretty much don't want to talk about it. So I've pretty much left it alone. Uh, maybe the answer will reveal itself somewhere, uh, somehow, but, uh, you know, I'm innocent in this. I have nothing to do as, as far as like, you know, putting those things in my back or, or, or my knee. And why would I? <laughs> do they affect your daily efforts outside of airports? No, not really. Um, I, you know, again, when I found out about them, it was when I worked at, you know, again, a uh, retail store. But beyond that, in the airport, there really hasn't been any other uh, issue or problem. Uh, but again, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not hurting. And I believe they also said that when they were x-rayed, they, they also said that the same thing about the uh, ones in the knee, where it looked like there was a cocoon of tissue around them, almost like a buffer to protect. So again, it just seems very, you know, I don't know if that's like a self-defense mechanism too, of course, with the, the human body, but it seems to me like what they were saying was it's very neat. They, you know, whatever it is, they're very neatly in these, um, in this muscle tissue of yours. So I'm not really sure what it is. And there's a part of me that, I don't know, maybe I don't really want to know, <laughs> you know, but we'll see. It, it may reveal itself some way, somehow. No kidding. No kidding, because so many people are wondering what is going on. Do you think, and I'm not trying to get conspiratorial here for a moment, but do you think that that the doctors are shying away from looking into what these metal particles are in you because they don't want to get involved with anything to do with UFOs or aliens? Uh, there's a possibility of that. Um, honestly, there was one doctor, and I'll never forget her, um, and, and not for a good reason, um, who she took a look at the x-rays, and every time I opened my mouth to ask a question, she kept shooting me down. She kept saying, you know, things like, you know, 
uh, you know, we don't know. Uh, there's no, you know, we have no idea what this is. Uh, you know, maybe you just, you know, had an accident and you don't remember. And she's telling me things that and trying to implant these scenarios in my head that I know never happened. When she did it the third time, I kind of went, you know what? It's almost like she's putting up a block, almost as if there's something that she does know about these things, but is not allowed to talk about. And she was the one that really stood out amongst all these other doctors. All the other doctors pretty much did the same thing. They just listened to me, talk about it a little bit, but they didn't have any answers. And they didn't um, go into, you know, that's that's that whole thing about like not feeding into somebody's delusion. But this is not right. delusional. The x-ray showed it. So, uh, but they just didn't want to get involved. And once that third doctor, when she kind of shot me down, I kind of felt like, there's something else going on here. But again, I didn't want to venture too far into that because, you know, there's <laughs> obviously there's some factions of this that I don't necessarily want to get into and uh, approaching that would be trying to find out why these doctors seem to be blocking me. That's really incredible. Really incredible that that is happening to you. Was there ever a break... Yeah. Was there ever a break in your abductions? Oh, yes, they, there have been. And, uh, you have been times where nothing has happened for years and then something suddenly happens. And, um, I recently had something like that happen, uh, in August, this August, this past August. Uh, I was actually on my way home on the freeway, uh, down going to heading downtown on the freeway at night and for whatever reason over an overpass uh, bridge, I thought I saw something that looked kind of black and shiny and it just looked like it was just sitting there on the bridge. But as I got closer, I started to see space in between it and the bridge and it was a large object. I don't know what this was, but it was just kind of hovering. And then I saw it lower just a little bit. And that's when I kind of went, uh, okay, I'm, I'm driving at 60 miles an hour. I'm on the freeway. I can't stop. And I said something in the car, I can't repeat on the uh, air here, but as I got closer to it, I actually drove right under this thing and it had four lights on it, two very large white lights, and then one kind of amberish looking light and one green light. And it, they were flashing kind of intermittently, but slowly. And I didn't know what this was. I've never seen anything like this. I mean, I've seen, yes, I have seen craft but this is the closest I've been to something, but I still couldn't make out the shape because it was dark outside and this object was very dark itself, but I could see those lights. And that's when, when I, <laughs> when I passed from under there, I, I, there was a part of me that wanted to go ahead and go off to the side and get out of the car and take a look. And something told me not to, I mean, and I'm not saying somebody told me I'm saying within myself, I said, just leave it alone and just keep driving. So I did, at least I think I did, <laughs> you know, uh, but that to me was kind of, it seemed again, very purpose. The first thing I started thinking was, was I getting sleepy on the road and were they, were they trying to wake me up? Um, but I wasn't sleepy. I mean, I was leaving work, so I'm not really sure what that was. And, um, you know, the first person I've actually talked to about this in any big way, because oh, wow. it was again, downtown. So Nobody else is saying anything about it. Nobody else saw anything, but um, I don't know what that was. Doesn't that drive you crazy? When you have that yeah. experience and you can't even explain it to yourself, what it is you saw or experienced? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, because there's no, I mean, again, there's there's nothing that you can really do. And I was at a position where I was driving. I couldn't really stop. Uh, to take a look at this thing and, you know, get, you know, have somebody crash into me or something. So uh, I just thought, you know, maybe I'm imagining this, but I mean, I remember actually just slapping myself in the face as I'm in the car to make sure that I'm awake, that I'm seeing this. And mm -hmm. I was, but again, I just don't know what this was and what the purpose of it was. So do you know, um, I'm do you know if any of the, sorry for interrupting. Do you know if anybody else in traffic saw what you saw? There was one car I remember ahead of me, and it was, I remember it was kind of like a uh, SUV or something, but they were like far ahead of me. But 
they seem to be, you know, they were just, again, just like me. I mean, they were driving me. You couldn't stop. It's not like you could stop. But it was at night, and there were not a whole lot of cars out there. I just remember seeing that one ahead of me, and it went right under that bridge where this craft was hovering. And here I was going to do the same thing. But I tried to slow down a little bit to take a better look, to look out the windshield and look up. And that's when I saw the four lights kind of, you know, doing a, a, a slow pulsating kind of flash. And that's where I left it. I just kept driving and I went home. I didn't say anything to anybody. I got home. I didn't talk to anybody, didn't call anybody. Because what's the use? I mean, I didn't feel like anybody was going to, um, I mean, yes, I have family and friends who understand me. I, it took me a while to actually even open up about it. And I think the first person I told was my mother. Um, but outside of that, I didn't really talk that much about it. And I haven't until now. So now your whole audience knows about it. <laughs> we got about five and a half minutes left before we go to break at the top of the hour. Craig Jankox is our friend and guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Aware of their presence is his book on Amazon. You want to check that on out. Now, with all the experiences that you had, a lot of experiencers get signs that they are going to be taken or have some sort of encounter. And to give you an example, for me, my uh, sign that I know when I am about to be taken is, do you remember on Pink Floyd's The Wall where they sing, is there anybody out there? Mm -hmm. That is mine. That's when I know. When, yeah, when it's going to you know, happen. Right. And I do think that to some degree, um, just like I was telling you earlier in the show, uh, before my first encounter, I kept thinking about, for whatever reason, uh, about a sighting that happened in my childhood of all times. Right. And it just didn't make any sense to me. But um, there have been times where I've had dreams about something happening, and then it happens when it comes to this uh, subject matter. So um, I think sometimes I get little clues like that every now and then, but it, it has not been as often. It, it, I don't get that, that uh, kind of, you know, warning or, you know, um, alert first that other people do. Mm -hmm. So everybody's, everybody's experience is different. It's, you know, there's always some variation in them uh, between people, but, you know, there are some things that obviously we can all kind of agree upon. PBR is asking, do you set off metal detectors? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, I have. And uh, again, the airport was the main one when I went to the airport. Uh, obviously, security is very tight in airports and whatnot. But that's when um, that was very obvious at that point that there was metal in my body. Hmm. couple follow-up questions from PBR. Have you ever seen the documentary To Be Chosen? If so, what are your thoughts? <laughs> they, well, I tell you what, they are being, uh, <laughs> that's funny that they say that. I think they're actually trying to get me to talk about something. I was in this movie. Uh, I was in the documentary To Be Chosen, and uh, I co-produced it. And um, I, believe it or not, as strange as this sounds, I've never seen it all the way through. I've only seen little bits and pieces. Number one, I have problems sometimes watching myself on television. But the second thing is, is that um, there were some creative differences within the movie uh, between me and the, the main producer. Although he did, he did a good job. I mean, he did what, what he could with what we had. And um, I, enjoy, I enjoyed the process of being in a, in a film, but uh, there were some things that, you know, uh, we, I kind of wish I, I had gotten across a little bit better and that wasn't anybody's fault. It just kind of just worked out that way. But, but yeah, it's, it's a film that I was in. It was a documentary that I was in. And, um, I'm, again, at, in retrospect, I'm glad that I did it. Well, for those of us who haven't seen it, what's it all about? <laughs> well, it basically, it has to do with, uh, people like me who have had uh, experiences with uh, alien abduction. And, you know, again, this was years ago. I, I honestly, today, the way I feel about things today, I don't know if I would actually be in a, in a documentary. But, um, but at the time, 
things were still kind of, you know, heavy in my mind about it and things were pretty right. fresh. So, uh, so I went ahead and, and did that. And I knew a lot of people within the community. So I got some other people to talk, uh, or to get involved in it too. So it was, you know, like I said, it was an interesting experience. Uh, I obviously, uh, this person that your, your caller has seen it. Uh, I have never seen it all the way through. So it's hard for me to comment on it, but, um, but for what it's worth, a lot of people have seen it and have said that they really liked it. So, um, it's, uh, I would still want people to, if they want to know my story, the book actually explains a lot more than the movie does, but you know, uh, but both of them have enough that, you know, people will understand where I'm coming from. Right. Well, that sounds cool. Where can we find it? Uh, that's also on Amazon. Um, okay, cool. I honestly, uh, I won't, lie, I won't lie. I don't have much to do with, uh, the movie, uh, itself, uh, anymore, but, uh, but, uh, obviously the book is really personal and I've had people tell me that they, not only could they not put the book down, but some people told me they read it overnight. They read the whole thing. And that's obviously as an author, that's a big comp. And, I appreciate that. I appreciate, you know, your comments uh, who have, you know, read about it and written some of my story because again, I'm just being as honest as I can about it. Yes. Is there another one coming? Do you feel the need to write more? I, I do. Uh, although what I'm, what I was writing recently actually is more of a fiction story. It has nothing to do with UFOs, but um, I do have a feeling that a follow up, would be necessary based on what I was telling uh, you and your audience tonight, um, you know, about finding these objects in my body, uh, about going these long spans without anything. And then suddenly something happening uh, and about some of the incidents of, I'm going to say, like I said, quote, help unquote that I've gotten from these right. uh, apparent beings. So uh, there, there's still a lot to talk about. I, I would say that. So, I mean, this possibility, I, I don't count anything now as far as writing goes. Well, I think there's a lot of people out there, Craig, who would like to see you do more like that. Well, I may. And, you know, again, it's, it's time, it, you know, of course, life happens and, you know, you have your job and you have, you know, your duties and things that you have to take care of. But um, I would like to, you know, go ahead and write more about that. And if there's another way to actually get out there and maybe talk about it, uh, I may get back into that, too. Because, again, it's been a long time since I've done this. So you, you're the first interview I've done in years as far as the subject matter and my experiences. So uh, I appreciate you having me on. I definitely, you know, I've had a good time talking to you. All right. Well, we got you for another 30 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. Author Craig Jacox, his book, Aware of Their Presence. You can find it on Amazon. It's one of the real good ones out there. Pretty cheap, too. Only like 12 bucks. So go get it. We'll be back with Craig and Hour 3 of Spaced Out Radio after this. On the first Tuesday of every month, I encourage you to come along for a journey with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You. Together, we will take a look at how to access the highest expression of yourself and change your life, consciousness, ET contact, health, and wellness. We can talk about it all. So come along for a spiritual ride with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You, only on Spaced Out Radio. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiele. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. 
SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio, we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! Looking for something new to push your limits? Look Beyond the Spectrum, a new docuseries featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and Bigfoot in the forest. Truth seekers like Steve Bassett, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Richard Dolan, as well as others all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are, and what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best five dollars a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. 
Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Hour 3 of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. Good to have each and every one of you listening on in. I am your host, Dave Scott. I want to give a shout-out to everyone listening in on WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia. KZFX 93.7 FM in Ridgecrest, California. KDUN AM 1030 in Reedsport, Oregon. We're on UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans and down in Dangerfield, Texas, AM 1560 KDNF. On the digital side, we say hello to everyone listening in on Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. Great to have you with us. Don't forget, all of our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Schmegagee. Schmegagi is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. It's updated daily. If you've had a sighting or an experience you can't explain, fill out a sight lines report or just get your horns up and rock out to Bumblefoot. We have more features coming very, very soon as well. For the final time tonight, we introduce Craig Jaycox. He's got a great book out called Aware of Their Presence. This is about his life of ET contact and abduction, and we are glad to have him. You can find the book on Amazon. I highly suggest you do. It's a good, good read, solid read, so make sure you pick it on up. Craig, welcome back to the show. Uh, Thank you, Dave. Craig, I, I'm going to ask you this, and I'm going to get a little controversial here for for a second, because Every time we, or I'm going to say most of the time, when we hear about alien abduction, it's usually of Caucasian people. You are of African-American descent. Obviously, the, the most popular would be Barney Hill from Betty and Barney Hill being abducted. How come we do not hear a lot of stories from the African American population regarding ET contact and abduction? Well, you're not the first to ask uh, about that. I've heard that over uh, different, you know, years as I did talks uh, at different, you know, uh, venues and whatnot. And uh, I actually think that it is just a cultural type thing. And uh, just based on the experience of being African-American or really uh, other, you know, minorities or whatnot, there's, there's, a, there's a certain kind of taboo. Uh, that goes even further with with uh, certain races. I think this is just my opinion, but certain taboos that go with, with you know certain other races where it's really not talked about. And I think, but then again, sometimes it, it could just be one of those things where we have enough on our plate already as it is. Uh, I don't want to add this. I don't want to add something else that's going to be uh, you know a, a strain or a stress or a question. Uh, so I think a lot of people just, you know, again, uh, people of other races, maybe, uh, well, Caucasian people too, don't necessarily want to talk about these things either, but I think with minorities, it may just be a little bit stronger because of just life experience and, you know, just feeling like, okay, I don't need, I'm trying to feel better about where I am and what I'm doing and feel freer, freer in my mind and, this is not something that's going to make you feel free in your mind. Uh, so I think a lot of people just kind of 
dismiss it. Or I don't want to say dismiss it, but they just don't want to get into it if it is happening to them. Do you believe that it is happening as frequently as it is, say, for Caucasian people? Um, that is hard to gauge. Uh, I'm not totally sure about that. Uh, I would say that, you know, just knowing that, you know, Barney Hill was one of the first people that we knew of who had had this experience that actually talked about it um, is a clue that it probably is as prevalent, but I, um, it, there's no way to, I, I being very honest with you, uh, I have not been approached by a lot of other African Americans about the experience or them having the experience. But again, it goes back to those reasons. I, I mean, I've had, you know, different audiences and people in my, uh, you know, talks of different races all the time, but, they, uh, for the most part, minorities, you know, whether they're, you know, again, uh, African American or Hispanic, don't necessarily approach me. They they listen, but they don't necessarily approach me and tell me this has happened to me. Um, I haven't gotten a lot of that, but I do believe that it does happen to you know just about everybody. I don't think that's one thing. That if there's one good thing about these grays or whoever the aliens are, it doesn't seem like they have any preference on race. They kind of pick on everybody. <laughs> no, and, and I can understand that, but does it bother you that other minorities are not coming out about this as much? Uh, not terribly. Um, I mean, maybe it's because I can understand why they might not want to, but it does. The only thing is it does feel a little bit isolating, you know, or I, or I feel a little isolated uh, because I don't see a lot of other, you know, black people coming out and talking about this or saying that this has happened to them. It's just not something that, you know, you see a lot of. And, um, you know, I, I mean, honestly, the people who have approached me, who have seen me talk, they, they respect the fact that I am up there talking about it or that I've written about it. But for the most part, um, I, but I agree. I mean, I just don't see it that prevalent as far as people, you know, actually saying that this has happened to them and being of a minority. All right, let's move on here. And thank you for answering that very candidly and honestly. John on Twitter at hashtag spaced out radio is asking, Craig, have you ever tried to communicate in any way with the implants in your body? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, it's a good question, but you know, honestly, the answer is no at this point. I think I've been more curious about what they are and why they're there uh, as opposed to trying to get kind of a, I don't want to say interface, but um, but trying to, you know, communicate somehow with them. Although, I will say this. There have been times, there have been some sightings I've had where I have really been in trouble. And I don't mean just my health. Uh, there is a chapter in the book where I was basically walking home at night and was approached by a bunch of guys who obviously didn't mean, uh, you know, they were going to just say hi to me. And basically they approached from the side and I kept walking but I had that fight or fight, you know, kind of instinct in my brain. And one of them, I, I could hear some footsteps behind me. They were now following me and I was going to turn around. But before I could turn around, there is a craft in the sky flying over a church. And this was late at night. All I saw were three lights. Uh, it looked like two lights at the tip of the wings. And then one at like a, at the, the head of this object. And it was coming right toward me. It was right over the church. It made no noise. And, uh, I looked back to see where they were. They were gone. And then I looked to see where this craft was. It should have still been over the church, but now it was higher in the air, but turning and going away very slowly. And it was a V shaped object. It looked like a boomerang. So when your, your caller says something about like communicating with these objects, it's more like I felt like somebody picked up on something that I was feeling, which at that point was that, you know, that, you know, that feeling of, of fear and that feeling of, okay, I'm going to have to fight for my life here or something. And somebody picked up on it. And uh, who they are, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they thwarted the whole situation. But when I turned to look to see where these guys were, they were gone. And I looked to see where this object was. It seems like there was a little bit of time that was gone because there's no way this object could have been where it was where I first saw it and then jumped up in the air right over me and then just flew off. So that's that's the only thing I could kind of connect to that, to what your uh, questioner is asking me. 
All right. Let's move on to another question. PBR is asking if you've ever had an MRI to locate these objects that are stuck in you. No. Uh, actually, I was told I can't have an MRI because, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, basically, it's like because of them being metallic in the first place, apparently if I got an MRI, it would actually cause a lot of problems for me. Uh, so I basically just got these, um, you know, in a regular x-ray and, um, they were found that way, but I, I've always been curious about that, but I was, I did, that's one thing I can say that these hospitals did tell me you can't get an MRI because this would be because of the objects being metal themselves, this might cause an issue. Uh, they didn't go deep down into what those issues were. I can kind of figure it out, but you know. Um, I just kind of went, well, okay, you know, we'll, then we'll leave that out of the question. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's how I would answer that. Yeah. I was, so I cannot do the MRIs. Where do you go from here? Lifelong experiencer living with this. You've written a book about it. You've probably have more experiences to write in a secondary book and a follow up to it. What's your plans? Well, you know, I have thought about writing a follow-up, but it would be really more analytical uh, as opposed to what Aware of Their Presence is, which is really all about the experiences and things that I saw and felt and went through. Uh, this one would be more of a reflective type thing, whereas, uh, you know, I mean, it would be more about the uh, issues I've had to deal with, the cost that you have to deal with, uh, because there is a cost to looking into these things and sharing it with people. But also some of the new experiences. I mean, again, that that uh, sighting in August, that was something very different. I did not expect that. And I do suspect that there may be more to that. I don't think that I just happened to go under this thing and look at these lights and nothing else occurred. Um, just knowing what UFO abduction entails, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if memories of something come back um, beyond just seeing the object itself. So there may be more, um, and I don't know if that's kind of another restart. I don't know if that means things are going to start up again. But again, I'm I'm a lot more objective about it now. Um, I don't. Uh, before I was pretty much in the midst of it and in the chase of it, and kind of excited by it, even though I didn't know what it meant. Uh, but I was much younger then, and now I'm 53, and I'm mellowed a bit about it. Uh, I'm a little bit more, you know, let's take our time about it as opposed to. I've got to solve this now. I've got to tell everybody, you know what I mean? Just the emergency kind of urgency, you know, urgency kind of feeling that's not there anymore. Right. Do you want your experiences to start up again? Not necessarily. No. Um, I did, but you know, it, it seems to me that I don't really have that much of a choice when they happen, they kind of happen. Uh, I don't ask for them. Uh, and that's the one thing I think most people who are listening, who have gone through this, who haven't necessarily talked about it, um, you can't predict it. It's kind of like an earthquake. You know, you can't predict it. Uh, you can just kind of try to roll with it. And uh, it's just one of those things where I, I don't know if I'm going to learn anything more. I mean, I mean, I think that was the, the motivation back when I was younger was that if I go through this more, maybe I'll learn what it's all about. And I never really got to learn what, what anything was about. And that's why I've always kind of had a, 50 50 plus minus kind of feeling about this whole thing and, and these beings, whoever they are, if they're real and, you know, they just don't seem to really reveal much, uh, whether it's a good reason or a bad reason. I have no idea. Right. So with that, and you're saying you're not sure if you would want them to happen again, if they did start up again, would you feel a little bit lost? Would you feel a little bit, you know, in wonderment and bewilderment as to why all of a sudden it's happening again? Like, what do they want from you this time? I I would be, I would be curious. I would be, you know, still wondering why after all this time is this starting up again? Is there some reason? And this time, would you please give me some answers as opposed to just doing something and then just, you know, letting me wonder about it because I think basically that's what can actually drive people crazy is not knowing what this is and then trying to figure it out. I think there's more craziness in trying to figure it out 
as opposed to the incidents themselves, um, because that's where the confusion is. And that's where, you know, a, a lot of the bewilderment is about this, this, this thing. So all these little facets of, you know, if you were to dice it up and look at all the subject matters and the, you know, the, the different features of this, all of them, none of them are really all that grand. Um, the bewilderment, the confusion, the trying to talk to some people, the people thinking that you're crazy. Again, the only light I've got really is that I've got some family and friends who are really standing by me. By the way, one shout out to a woman named Viviana, who I know in, in Los Angeles. She was She's one of the in our chat that room actually tonight. Really... What's that? She's in our chat room tonight. She is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> she's she's one of my best friends, and you Wonderful. know, she was one of the people that I went to and talked to about this. She was very open about it and very understanding. I uh, did not judge, and that's what people like me want in this. So I I really appreciate her, and I'm sure I'll probably be talking to her in the next few days. But but basically, uh, again, if we can have more people like her who at least listen and don't make judgments. I think we can actually go forward in finding out what, what's going on here. That is important because the hard part is feeling all alone, isn't it? Yes, it is. It really is. Um, you know, I mean, it's great that, you know, people do talk about it and that some people have written about it, but for the most part, it's still not taken seriously. And I've got to tell you, uh, the whole thing with the, I remember the area 51 thing and, Yes. the UFO Congress thing. And I, I, I'm sorry, people dressing up in costumes and making a mockery of this, that's not a help. Even if, if they actually believe in this stuff, they would take it seriously. Because for people like me and people like you who actually take it seriously, I'm not dressing up in a costume. I don't think this is fun or funny. Um, and if you've ever been through this, there's nothing to laugh about. So I think, I didn't mean to be dour or anything like that about it, but it's just, mm -hmm. I just don't think there's anything to be uh, celebratory or fun or make fun of it. So, I mean, it's just a different way of making fun of it as far as I'm concerned. We've got about five and a half minutes left with you tonight, Craig. And this is a show that's flown on by. I want to ask you about the whole disclosure movement, what you've seen. And, and you kind of brought up the Area 51 uh, situation there a couple of weeks ago. But here, here's a thing that a lot of experiencers have told me. All right. And I'm curious to get your opinion on this. We have a lot of people talking about disclosure, that UFO and alien disclosure is going to be happening very soon, maybe as early as next year in 2020. And as an experiencer, we, we sit around and we listen that we're talking about all the technologies, the military involvement. Are they a threat? Are they not a threat? So on and so forth. How do you feel about the fact that Nobody is talking about the experiencer in all of this. It's still the taboo subject, even though this topic has become so mainstream recently over the last year and a half. But talking about aliens and abduction, that just seems to be rife with controversy still. Well, I think, okay, you know, the first thing that came to my mind was something that I thought about this a long time ago with this question. And that is, that I think, you know, most of the time when you see skeptics get on the air or on a show and they're talking about why this didn't happen and why these people, this and that, it's usually somebody from the scientific community. And I get that. And I mean, it makes sense. It's basically what they've learned and what they've gone through and, 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 and experienced for themselves is, is the field of science. But I also think that to some degree, they actually feel like this can't be because I didn't discover it. It's almost as if the people who have gone through this, the experiencers or people who have got these, whether, whatever way you want to call them, contacts, if we actually are a part of something, it gets to people who have been in science for many, many years that they weren't, you know, a part of it or that they weren't clued in on it first. So ordinary people having these extraordinary experiences is almost offensive to them. That's, that was what I thought back then. I kind of still kind of think that way now. The only difference would be I can understand tiptoeing into it and being careful about it and starting with the sightings and, and possibilities of life beyond Earth as opposed to talking to uh, you know people who have experienced this. But I just still feel like as far as scientists, uh, the scientific community, 
they make a mockery of it at times. And I just don't think that's, I mean, obviously it's not nice, but there may be a reason behind it. You know, I mean, it's like because they want to be the ones who discover something. And if experiencers are the ones that are actually part of the discovery, they feel like they can cheat it. I know I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but that's kind of where I feel, you know, where the scientific community is on this. Right. And that's kind of leading why I asked you earlier whether or not you want this to happen again, because on a personal level, for some people, this becomes an addiction, whether it is negative experiences or whether they are of the positive. And if you haven't had it in a while, it almost becomes addicting. Right. It was either, since me, for, for me, the addicting part was trying to, again, figure out what it was and hope that I can find out by having more experiences. But again, I was in my 20s when I was having that, that, that feeling. Um, and I didn't really find out anything. I didn't really get that far. And uh, it can be addicting. I mean, because let's face it, there's always there, there's an excitement about it, uh, about the subject matter in, in general. But the, the problem is, of course, a lot of it's been, you know, fictionalized. And in the majority of people's minds, it's still a fiction thing, period. So for people to actually say that they've seen something or they've experienced something, it kind of gets laughed at because that's been marketed as fantasy. Uh, right. so that's kind of where we've been stuck for a while. If something does open up, uh, it'd be great. If, if, you know, I, I'm not, I don't mean to be throwing cold water on it, but I, I, I'm not real enthusiastic about disclosure, but if something does happen, uh, I mean, I'm obviously going to be open to it and listen. And I think everybody should. With about one minute to go, do you think the answers are out there? I do. I do. I, I, I also think that we're going to find, if we do find it anytime soon, it's going to be in a very unusual way, but uh, it may be a collective thing. We'll, we will see. I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I'm, I'm cautiously hopeful about that, but we'll see. Craig, I want to say thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio tonight. I do have to ask, though, can we make it less than four years until you're on again? <laughs> yes. I, I promise you that. I do promise you awesome. that. Thank you for having me back on. And, and, and thank you thank, thank you to your audience, too, for listening in tonight. Do me a favor. Tell everybody where they can buy your book. Uh, it's, it's on Amazon. Uh, actually, it's on uh, you know different outlets, too, but Amazon is the main one uh, that you can find it online. And it's actually nine ninety nine now. So it's not uh, $12. It's nine ninety nine. I'm looking at Canadian prices, my friend. I'm looking at Canadian oh, I got prices. This. Right. Oh, okay. All right. So over there, it's 12. Okay, I got you. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. Not a problem. What what a pleasure to have you on, my friend. And I cannot wait to do it again. Please stay in touch. Craig Jacobs, everybody. Go find his book, Aware of the Presence of Their Presence, on Amazon. 10 bucks in the U.S., 12 bucks in Canada. Coming up next, we have the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Day. Stay tuned. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. We're bringing you something new to the documentary world. Beyond the Spectrum will take you on an historic tour of topics like no other. Sasquatch, UFOs, government secrecy, and more. Keeping you on the edge of your seats through the eyes of legendary truth seekers like Steve Bassett, Richard Dolan, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, and Jack Kasher. Head on over to Amazon Prime or Tubi TV and check us out. Please leave a comment for the filmmakers on their film's Amazon page.
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiemann. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best $5 a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. 
Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Rounded third, we're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We want to give a quick shout out to David down, I believe, in Florida or wherever he may be. David's a listener of ours. He's also one of the great truck drivers on the road. He was involved in a horrific accident, but he is doing okay. He's going to be flying home out east very soon. David, we're thinking of you. Let's send you a lot of thought and prayers from everybody at Spaced Out Radio. Get well soon, my friend. Get well soon. Really appreciate you taking the time to listen, and we want to send you some love because of the difficult situation you're in right now. So appreciate it. And all the Spaced Out Radio listeners, send that love David's way. He needs it right now. I want to remind all of you that you can find all of our archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to Bumblefoot, fill out a Sightlines report, and catch all the news on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Speaking of Captain Shirk and the Newswire, here we go. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, and sometimes some serious news like we're going to get to right now. Remember two years ago, yesterday? Yeah, that's when the Las Vegas massacre happened, killing 58 people, injuring and wounding hundreds more. Well, apparently, lawyers representing the hundreds of wounded and family members of the 58 killed may have reached a settlement with MGM Resorts that could pay them up to $800 million. But while the money may be settled, the motive for the massacre still remains unknown. The announcement comes as events this week mark the two-year anniversary of the attack, in which gunman Stephen Paddock opened fire on concertgoers outside the Mandalay Bay Resort. Las Vegas law firm Eglett Adams says the amount of settlement depends on the number of plaintiffs who chose to take part. They go on to say, while nothing will be able to bring back the lives lost or undo the horrors so many suffered on that day, this settlement will provide fair compensation for thousands of victims and their families. Yeah, it should. MGM Resorts is a valued member of the Las Vegas community, and this settlement represents good corporate citizenship on their part. He added, we believe that the terms of this settlement represent the best outcome for our clients and will provide the greatest good for those impacted by these events. MGM, which owns the venue where the attack was carried out, has been defending itself from hundreds of liability lawsuits. They go on to say, our goal has been able to resolve these matters so our community and the victims and their families can move forward in the healing process. This agreement with the plaintiff's counsel is a major step and one that we'd hoped for a long time would be possible. Jim Murren, the chairman and CEO of MGM Resorts, said in a statement, goes on to say, we have always believed that prolonged litigation around these matters is in no one's best interest. It is our sincere hope that this agreement means that scenario will be avoided. The law firm says an independent party will be appointed by a court to evaluate claims and dole out money from the settlement fund and that the entire process should be completed by late 2020. Never listen to your GPS. Never. I never drive with one. Well, Michael Scott, no relation, had just been transferred to his office in the UK. But 
got in a little bit of trouble because rescue teams in the town of Ripon had to rescue two men and a bulldog on Monday after a truck driver followed his satellite navigation system's directions into a fast-moving river, reminiscent of the scene in The Office where Steve Carell's mistakenly character mistakenly drives his car into a lake. North Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Station Manager tweeted out about his interaction with the driver. I had only one question. Why did you attempt this? The response was, my sat-nav said this way. Unbelievable stupidity wins again. Technically, the device is the Ford Transit flatbed wasn't wrong, but was directing him down a paved Ford across the river scale that's typically covered with just a few inches of water. However, heavy rains in the area had caused it to rise several feet. A sign at the entrance said that the Ford may be unpassable at times. The passenger, Kieran Gibbons, made a video of the incident, which he told reporters afterwards, hey, could have been much worse. Of course it could. You could be dead. The emergency services said we could have lost our lives if we were two feet deeper. We would have been swept away down the river. It was proper bad. It was flowing really fast, about 70 miles per hour, apparently. Crews needed to enter the water to hook up a winch to pull the truck and its passengers to safety. Nobody was hurt. Authorities in Oregon have a pretty big clue about who broke into several vehicles in a Portland suburb recently after one of the break-ins and its stunned perpetrator were caught on camera. The incident happened early Tuesday in Beaverton when a woman's vehicle surveillance system caught a man getting into her car, looking straight into a dash camera and then hurrying out. I just wanted to make sure I got a really good look at him, and I laughed so hard at the shock of his face when the light came on. It was priceless, the woman who asked not to be identified. She goes, I couldn't stop laughing. I played it over and over. This guy looks like he just crapped his pants, to be honest. The woman says the owl cam dashboard camera started recording once the man opened her car door. She said incidents like this are why she purchased the $300 camera in the first place. You set off an alarm and it scares them away. You've kept your thing, but you don't have any proof of who did it. I want to know who. So that's why I got the camera. The woman said she didn't realize she had left her car unlocked until she found one door wide open with the glove box and center console also open. Now she wants the suspect's face to get as much attention as possible. Of course it will. It's social media now. The light comes on. It makes me laugh every time. Beaverton Police Department say they are investigating the break-in in addition to another incident at the same apartment complex earlier in the day. Turns out, Megalodon may not be as big as we thought. Yeah, well, this is a little bit of a strange report coming from Forbes. Now, we tend to believe that this ancient shark could be at least 60 feet long. Scientists have always maintained that this predator was a pretty big animal, with scientific literature length estimates ranging from 80 to 100 feet, while new research says the scientifically justifiable maximum size is no more than 50 feet. Oh, well, isn't that pleasant? We're so much safer now. Dr. Kenshu Shimada, a professor of paleobiology at DePaul University in Chicago and research associate at the Sternberg Museum in Kansas, was always fascinated by ancient shark fossils. In his younger years, he collected and studied megalodon and other myopliocene sharks while living in Japan. He says, I used to visit some fossil sites in the Kanto area with my mother. What triggered me to get into shark paleontology was, in fact, the megalodon, a 4.5 centimeter tooth. Yeah, well, good for him. So let's talk about how this thing is apparently shrinking now because we're so much safer at 50 feet rather than 60. Tell me about it. I know. Shimada compared the data to the largest known teeth, the Odidus Megalodon, which is currently in the Evolving Planet Exhibition at Chicago's Field Museum of Natural History. The fossil measures 6.4 inches, including the root. However, a tooth with the tallest crown, the shiny part, that measures 4.5 inches, excluding the root, is on display in Japan's National Museum of Science. Both come from the United States, and according to Shimada, come from individuals measuring 47 to 50 feet in length. So that's where about they stay. Larger teeth 
than these two do exist in private collections, notes Shimada. However, science requires reproductibility of data, or reproducibility, that is, and especially when it comes to fossils that are non-renewable resources, only information stemming from specimens housed in a museum collections under public trust count as scientific data. I want to know if he thinks Pluto is a planet. Totally different thing. But I want to know what he thinks of Pluto since he just ruined our image by 10 feet of Megalodon. Minimum 10 feet. Let's head down to Abilene, Texas, where police released dramatic surveillance video this week showing a 60-year-old woman fighting off an armed robber at a bank. Yeah, police say the incident happened back on September 24th at a first state bank where the suspect forced the woman who was also an employee there, into the building at gunpoint as she was walking inside. According to police, another bank employee arrived and was also held at gunpoint by the suspect. Surveillance video then showed the 60-year-old woman, later identified as Jill Beatty, getting into a fight with the suspect as he continued to hold on to his weapon. The suspect ultimately ran away from the bank without taking any money, Police have also tied the suspect to two other bank robberies in July 2016 and April 2015. Abilene Police Chief Stan Standridge praised Beatty for her actions at preventing the robbery. She is a remarkable citizen. She showed remarkable calm. She never lost her head. That's got to be a pun. Come on! She almost lost her head. The guy had a gun. What if he had pulled the trigger, Police Chief Stan? She never lost her head. She, in fact, negotiated with him. Like, who says that stuff? She thought was almost killed. Oh, I'm sure he didn't mean it the way I'm taking it. But I'm taking it the way I take it. It's much more fun, don't you think? All right. You know... I'm a big believer that we went to the boon with the Apollo 11 and everything. You know, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, apparently the iconic image of Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin looking at the flag on the surface of the moon has been given a new lease on life after an amateur photographer restored the image to reveal Aldrin's smiling face. Andy Saunders, a property developer from England, said that he used the photo-enhancing technology used by astronomers and hours of hard work to clean up the image. Aldrin is seen smiling at the camera, but being held by Neil Armstrong on the lunar surface. I wonder how many people would realize, based on the original image, that Buzz is, vi- Buzz is visible. Saunders said in the comments, Yeah, he goes on to say, It must have been viewed billions of times. What's interesting is it's one of the most iconic images of all time, and it has been holding this detail, which I've managed to reveal. At the start of the heyday of the photo, the photo was used by a television station to mark itself. Mark it itself. Oh, yeah, that's back MTV days. Remember they used the photo to mark it itself, replacing the flag with its logo? Yeah, remember that? Remember when MTV actually played music? Yeah, hard to believe. Anyway, Saunders from Cheshire, England, said that he spent hours working on the photo, brightening it and darkening it, sometimes just a few pixels at a time, eventually revealing Aldrin's smiling face behind the helmet glass. Although I'm the first to do it, it's not really that technical, he says. I just used photo processing equipment and dedication. I alter the contrast, reduce the sound, and edit the highlights on the countless amount of layers. That looks pretty good. It actually does. The old Buzzy hanging out there on the moon. You see the before and after photos. It's actually quite impressive. Very impressive. We're going to move on here. Because Captain Shirk loves her tardigrades. These little minuscule microbial animals that just are like indestructible and they're like all over your body and face and they're actually kind of healthy for you. They don't even have eyeballs, but they have like this machine gun nose, like a like an A-10 Thunderbolt. Anyways, tardigrades are sometimes colloquially 
known as water bears or moss piglets. In all fairness, though, no bear nor piglet ever dreamt of doing the amazing things these uniquely gifted creatures are capable of. Tardigrades are known for their incredible resilience as they are able to survive all manner of extreme conditions. When things are getting tough, they basically transform into glass for decades at a time, perhaps even centuries. They tolerate temperature extremes and the even cold vacuum of space does not phase them. While we're on that topic, tardigrades may also have just begun to colonize on the moon. It's an impressive achievement for something shorter than a millimeter. Where do all of these strange superpowers come from? The origin story of these aquatic organisms is a matter of ongoing scientific inquiry. But researchers think they've now at least solved the mystery of one of the water bear's weirdest abilities. One of the things that makes tardigrades so seemingly indestructible is a built-in radiation shield of sorts. A study in 2016 discovered that a protein unique to tardigrades called DSUP, or damage suppressor, could suppress X-ray induced DNA damage in human cells by approximately 40%. Like, shoot me up some tardigrades here. I could use some. Yeah. Researcher Takuma Hashimoto says, we're really surprised. No kidding. It's, it is striking that a single gene is enough to improve the radiation tolerance of a human cultured cell. Wasn't well, that nice? They're still ugly, though, these tardigrades. Finally, Mark Windsor says two people just strolled into his pet store the other day, grabbed a handful after handful of bull penises, and took off. Yeah, of course this didn't happen in Florida. Close enough, Newfoundland. To be more specific, they grabbed dehydrated bull... I almost said the... Yeah. <laughs> Bull penises. The dried and stretched penises are known as pizzles. They are popular and tasty chew toy for a dog. Windsor, owner of the pet zone in St. John's, notified police immediately. He spoke to the media about the brazen theft. He's, he says, it's a popular item, I guess. It's just digestible. It's just easier for a dog to chew on, you know, years ago. It was the old, I don't know if everyone remembers, but it was the old bleached white and brown rawhide, which made much more difficult to digest. And the taste, and not to sound gross or nothing, but the taste is much more flavorful for a dog. Oh. I can't even look at the picture. This story is just grossing me out. I had to do it because I got challenged to. Captain Shirk, don't blame me. Blame the people on Twitter for setting this up they wanted me to read it yeah so people are apparently uh, stealing bull dinkies and that's a popular thing in newfoundland what they're doing with them we never know what the newfies do with anything they're a weird store remember they are four and a half hours difference in time who steals this Thought of the day happens every night at this time where bull penises. Really? Where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages and read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's thought of the day is as follows. What's it like to be abducted by aliens? Probably like stealing bull penises. Stockton, they don't whine and dine you. At least you're not stealing your private parts. Eric, sounds like we, we used to call a bum trip, according to Whitley on his way to the Chiffy Lube. Oh, my. Oh, my. Trip, not really sure, but have never figured out why the bottle of lube is half empty and the sheets are slick next to me. You pervert. You went there. Mike, a metaphysical experience is my guess. Daniel, it's like being rubbed with butter, then bathed in a warm vat of creamed corn, respectively. What the heck does that mean? What, what, what is happening during your abductions, man? What's wrong with you people? This is hilarious. Lone Wolf, yes, Earthling, you're going to get probed, laughs the alien. 
Alien Spoonie, Uncomfortable, and then Incredible, but mostly Weird. Okay. We'll take that. We can accept those answers. Jade, one good kick in the Galian Ganacles, and it won't happen. You know, you shouldn't threaten that, Jade, to any male. That hurts. Just thinking about that hurts. Tony, getting probed is not a good thing. At least for me. Grant, I see you chose to use the word abducted. Are you sure that's the word you want to use for this question? Well, yes, it is, because I typed it in there. Renee, have no idea, Dave. As far as I know, I have not been abducted. Seen UFOs, but that is it. Oh, Renee, you have so been abducted. Gabe, having six months of my memories as a four-year-old taken away from me, along with my childhood friend who gave me my first big wheels, I don't remember. It sucks bad. Alfred says, not fun. Jeremy says, ask Travis Walton. I did, a couple weeks ago. His stories change. It's not like fire in the sky. Kelly, I think Gail would be the only one that could confirm this. Of course, she's kind of biased on the issue. We know what Rob Zombie song she has on replay about what everyone is doing on a UFO. What? What? Ooh, that is a good one. We better end it right there because we know Gail and UFOs and Rob Zombie. It always ends very, very sweaty. Yeah. Thank you to everyone participating in the Thought of the Day. We'll do it all again tomorrow on Facebook and Twitter. Big thanks to Captain Shirk for putting our news together. And, of course, Craig Jaycox for coming on in. Go to Amazon to pick up Aware of Our Their Presence. Aware of Their Presence. Great book. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is what? The official music of Spaced Out Radio rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in tonight. Thank you so much for hanging on out with us. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyrighted by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you, everybody, so much for sharing your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Have a good night, everybody. Rock with me. Come on. Hey, 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 come on, do it. Hey, 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 last time, take it away. Have a good one. We'll do it again tomorrow.